So for those of you who haven't been here since last week, welcome. But I also want to recap for you. So this is what's going to happen. If you miss a message, you could just come back next week and then we'll recap it for you. But still come for the original part. So we started talking last week about hope and how Jesus is the hope giver. And so he came to earth first and foremost, to be the fulfillment of long-awaited hope. And so if you know anything about the Old Testament story, it's, it's all of these prophecies, over 300 of them, were specifically about Jesus coming. And so Jesus, uh, sorry, the Hebrews and the Israelites, and they were waiting for this Messiah figure. I don't know who he is. We just want this Messiah, this Savior to come. Jesus was the fulfillment of that long-awaited hope that they had. But even in that moment, so he's, he's come, but he came to give people hope. And I read from Luke 4, 18 and 19, which says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me liberty to proclaim to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind and to set liberty to those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So, so not only did Jesus come as the fulfillment of hope, he came to give people hope. And so if you were poor in spirit or poor physically, Jesus came to give you hope. If you were a captive spiritually or a captive physically, Jesus came to give hope. If you are blind spiritually or blind physically, Jesus came to give hope. If you are oppressed in spirit or oppressed, just oppressed, Jesus came to give hope. And so we have to sit in that moment because if we recognize that Jesus is the hope giver, that he also provides a future hope for us. And so we looked at Matthew 24 and Jesus is talking about the day of the Lord and the judgment coming. And so a lot of this stuff is setting up his birth pains. And so we get all worked up and worried when we hear about these birth pains. It's the baby's coming, the baby's coming and things are falling apart. And we're like the, the chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. but we can have hope because of Jesus. See, we don't have to worry about the, the struggle or the problems or the situation because we have this hope that Jesus says, I will take care of you. I will leave you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will come to you. But he, he, he proclaims that we will one day be in heaven with him. Right? We, I, I was a little, little solo last week. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come, right? So you guys missed that if you weren't here. So. But we have all of the, this hope is only found in the hope giver, which is Jesus Christ. And so we're coming into this, this next time of peace and, and peace is tied very similarly to hope. Because I, I asked this question last week. I'll ask it again. What do you do when circumstances of life don't always add up to your expectations? What do you do when the circumstances of life don't always add up to your expectations? So last week I said we whine or complain. Why? Why is this happening? Or maybe we, we get undone by it. We're overwhelmed by it. And so my argument to us last week was we misplaced our hope. And if we've misplaced our hope, no wonder we can't have peace. See, Hope is holding on to that future expectation. Hope is holding on to the belief that something will change, something will happen. Hope is tied to our faith in Jesus Christ. It's tied to what we believe. So when I am struggling physically, mentally, and emotionally, and my hope isn't placed in the proper thing, no wonder I don't have peace. See, I can have peace when I come to the peace giver. I can have peace when I don't completely understand the outcome. I can have peace when I place my hope, my faith in the peace giver, Jesus Christ. And ultimately, I can rest. That's the exhale. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I can rest when I come to the peace giver. That's why the title of today's message is Rest With Peace. And I was thinking about this. Somebody said it. It was part of the reading this morning. It's not rest in peace, right? Like rest in peace, you've passed on. No, no, it's rest with peace. See, I want you to see today where peace is found. 
I want you to see today that no matter the situation or circumstance you might find yourself in, peace is found in Jesus Christ. So this is some encouragement for us this morning. We're going to talk about peace with God because of Jesus. We're going to talk about peace of God because of Jesus and ultimately peace from Jesus. So first, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. This was read for us this morning, but I want us to see it more up, uh, uh, yeah, I'll say more up close. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. If you recall, we did a whole sermon series on the book of Romans. So this was very early on last year. And so like eight months later, we're going to talk about it again. It's fantastic. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. We're going to have peace with God because of Jesus Christ. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access by faith into the grace that which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Peace with God. And so how many of you, when you mess up or, or how do you feel when you believe you messed up? How do you feel when you believe that God doesn't love you because you messed up? See, maybe there's this tension spot that you see and you have in your life. Like, oh, I can't go to God because he'll be mad at me. Or I can't go to God because I'm going to get punished for it. I can't go to God because fill in the blank. See, whatever the reason you think you can't, Paul tells us here that you have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And I, and I like the phrase and I break it down this way just as if I'd never sinned, or just as if I never missed the mark. I've been justified by my faith. And so if I have faith or if I believe in Jesus Christ, I am therefore justified by that. See, our belief in Jesus was that he died, was buried, and rose again. So when I believe in that, that he's the only salvation for all of humanity, when I believe in that, when he's the one that comes to save, that's what justifies me before a holy God, our faith, that, that all the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ. That's what we're believing when we say our, this faith that we have justifies us. It's all of that took place for the glory of God. And so because all of that is true, what does Paul tell us? We have peace with God. We have peace with God, meaning the wrath of God is no longer on us. The judgment of God is not on us. It was poured out on Jesus Christ. Think about this with me, if you will. Have you ever been to a, a restaurant or in, the, in a Dunkin' Donuts line or somewhere where, where somebody else pays the bill for you? Have you experienced this in some capacity? That's what happened when Jesus went to the cross. It's I owed a bill and he paid the price. I was the one that was messed up and jacked up, but he took care of it for me. See, this is why we could say boldly that I have peace with God because I have faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. So even if I messed up, what's the truth? The cross was enough. Even if I made a mistake, even after being saved, the cross is enough. Jesus saved me from the wrath of God. His blood poured out for me on that cross. And because of all of this, Paul tells us that we have attained access to God. It means we're back into that, that right relationship from the Garden of Eden so long ago. We're back in that, that perfect, peaceful moment. We're back. Yeah, okay, our world's all in chaos and we get all of that. But no, we who are justified by faith have that access, that open door to God our Father. And so what should we do? Rejoice! Yay! This is good! This is awesome! Because I'm justified by my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm justified by what he did. And now I have access back to my loving, heavenly father. See, it, we get to go to God. We don't have to worry that he's going to punish us or judge us. We don't have to worry that, that our daddy might get mad. How many of you like have had a father that you, know, you get a little swat when you do something wrong? It's not like 
God's not going to swat you all the time. Okay? We rejoice because we're no longer at war with God. We are no longer at war with God. We have peace with God. That's God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. That's how it all works. Because I believe in Jesus Christ by faith, I have peace with God even when I make mistakes. Even when I miss the mark. After I believe. We have peace with God. See, this doesn't mean, though, I need to clarify this a little bit. This doesn't mean we get to do what we want, when we want, and how we want. Okay? Paul would make that argument in all the other passages, and we talked about it. Shall we sin go more so grace abounds? By no means. No, no, no. We don't get to do what we want, when we want, how we want. And so when I tell that lie, but what we do know is when I tell the lie at work or when I fall off the wagon for a period of time, the blood of Jesus paid for those things. It is sufficient to cover a multitude of sins. See, because the blood is sufficient, that means nothing needs to be added to it or taken away from it. I have peace with God who will sit one day in judgment, but I'm good because I got peace with God. What do we know? Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. We believe it. We believe what Christ did. We understand what Christ did. And this is what gives us the peace with God. So can we confidently declare that today? We have peace with God. Say it with me. I have peace with God. You have peace. Second thing I want you to see this morning, if you would, if you turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 was read earlier for us also. We have peace of God. So not only are we no longer warring against a holy God, we have the peace of God because of Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, verse 5 through 7. It says this. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Then what? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There it is again. Peace of God comes through Jesus Christ the Son. And so... What happens and where are we at and what's going on and, and this is anxiousness and this is my hope is misplaced and I don't know what to do. Do not be anxious about anything. Nothing. And I, and I know that's easier said than done, right? Because when we hear a command like that, it's like, of course I'm going to be anxious now. You can't just tell me not to and it stops and it shuts down. Right? You still worry about your job, your health, your family. You still do those things. So Paul's not telling us to... That... I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting excited about this. What I'd say to us today is that when you say that don't be anxious, it's going to cause more anxiety. And so instead of focusing on the command of being anxious, what does Paul tell us to do? in everything by, what's the word? Prayer. Everything by prayer. And so in order not to be anxious, the solution is prayer. And in everything, pray. This is counterintuitive for us. And because we think that our anxiety hinges upon me trying really hard. Or, or we think that my, my anxiety, my fearfulness, and my worry hinges on me medicating myself really well. Well, I won't worry now. Or we think that maybe even talking with a pastor is the helpful thing. No, what it, Paul tells us doesn't say any of those things. He says with prayer, 
is how you get through your anxiousness, your anxiety, your stress, your problems. So when I am anxious, what should I do? Pray. When I am worried, what should I do? Pray. When I am fearful, what should I do? See, it's a conversation with God. It's talking to God. It's expressing to God, this is how I'm feeling right now. The word supplication is seeking, asking, or pleading with God. We can get in those desperate moments, but instead of getting in those desperate moments by ourselves in a closet, no, we take it to God. But in everything, by prayer and supplication. But there's a key word that's next. It's thanksgiving. See, again, this is, this is how does this work? I'm not sure. Thanksgiving, it's out of the thankfulness of your heart that you go to God. So I'm anxious, but out of my thankfulness of heart? That doesn't make sense, does it? It's like, no, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm, I'm stressed, I'm freaked out. No, the thankfulness of God, or thankfulness to God. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you, God, for doing the work in me. Thank you, God, for dealing with my anxiety. Thank you, God, for blessing me. Right? It's, it's a posture of our hearts that we have to a holy God. So in order to, to deal with anxiousness or worry or fear, I pray or seek God with a thankful heart. See, that's hard to do. Because we don't want to thank God for our anxiety, do we? Come on, let's be honest. Like, no, this is terrible. I'm going to talk to my friends about this, maybe, or I'm going to keep it internalized. No. Thankful. God, thank you for that anxiety. I don't know what it was about. Can you do that? Are you able to do that? Thank you for that worry. Because you know that means I know I care. Can you do that? Think about that. See, Paul tells us here, it says, that thanksgiving heart to make our requests to God. The thing that, the, the, the word really in request is the thing that we require. Did you catch that? The thing that we require. So this is an opportunity to us to go to our heavenly father with boldness and courage to say, God, this is what I believe I really need. The thing that you require, the thing that you are pleading for, let it be known to God. See, this is the thing about, about doing this in, in such an order, and it's about the thankfulness of heart and taking it to God in prayer. It's not about God knowing it, right? God already knows what you need. It's about you recognizing what you actually need. So when I speak something out of my mouth, it's like, oh, hey, wait, that's what it meant in scripture when I read that phrase, or that's what it meant. It's about you. Not speaking something into existence, but it's about you aligning yourself with God. See, God already knows, but it's for you to come with that thankful heart. So when I am anxious about something, I take it to God in prayer with a thankful heart. Let my requests be made known to God. But it's ultimately to myself. It's me recognizing that I can't do this on my own. It's me recognizing that I have all this other stuff to be thankful for. I recognize that God has provided in the past. I recognize that God has been faithful before. I recognize that my needs have been met. I recognize that God is faithful. He loves me. He cares for me. But as an act of submission, surrender, and humility, dealing with the anxiety in my life, I bring my request to God. It realigns my thinking. It changes the view of my current situation. When my view is changed about the current situation, because of a thankful heart, I let God know my requests. And what happens? What happens when we, we kind of follow this pattern? What does Paul tell us? And the peace of God. We're not warring with God anymore. That's handled. Jesus did it on the cross, but now we have peace of God. And that peace of God, Paul tells us, surpasses all understanding. We can't comprehend what that means. It's above and beyond any knowledge that we can possibly have in this place today. It's this peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So this is where 
the peace of God comes in. This is where the peace of God comes from. When I am overwhelmed by the circumstances I find myself in, but I thank God through it, letting my request be made known, that's when, the moment, the peace washes over it. See, many of us have experienced that type of peace, especially going through medical trials, where we, somebody has a, a bad thing or cancer or something or that, and you're in the room and you don't know what to do, and, and it's almost like you give up in that moment. If you, if you, if you even picture this, it's like, I don't know what else to do, God. What are you doing? You're letting your request be made known to God. That's when you'll hear people say this. I had a peace about that. I had a peace about that surgery. I had a peace about that health issues. This is how we, how we deal with it. And it's, I have the peace about it. Well, why do you think that is? Because it's the peace of God that's surpassing all understanding. I don't know why I shouldn't. I should be chaotic like everybody else around here. It's the peace that surpasses all understanding. And, and, I, and I want to highlight this. It's not just passing it. Like, think about this as you, as you go down the road. It's like the car passes you and gets in front of you. No, no, no. It surpasses. It's, it's like that car is up the miles and miles ahead of you, a full bore on the gas going, right? It's surpassing all those things that we think and know and understand. That's where the peace of God comes from. It goes beyond the possibility of what is imaginable or what is even achievable by our own weak-minded thinking. See, how many of you seek peace in the midst of your circumstance this way? Maybe you try to breathe through it. I'm panicking. <sighs> Take some breaths. Or, or you try to meditate on it. I just need to be in a central location. Thank you, John. Yeah, get the breathe, get the breath. Meditate, meditate. Or, or you, you try to medicate. Do you medicate? It's like, oh, I, I, my therapist recommended this, so let me pop that pill. I'm not saying don't talk to a therapist, okay? Let me be clear. But it's, it's we medicate it, or it's like, take that thing, because that thing is what's going to give you the peace. It's fleeting. Maybe we try to talk through it. Maybe we try to work through it. We try everything we can to achieve peace in the middle of chaos. See, this is different than God's peace. The forms of peace from this world are temporary. They will not sustain you over long periods of time. You might experience some relief, right? Your body chemistry is changing and all this stuff. You might experience some relief, but those forms of peace don't last. This is why it matters when we bring my request to God with thanksgiving, no matter what those requests are. Did you hear that? Because some of us are scared to bring any request to God. Well, uh, God's going to get mad. No. Any request to God. I don't have to worry or be anxious because God's peace is greater, better, longer lasting than any other forms that temporarily might exist. And when I recognize all of that, that's what guards our hearts and minds, right? We have to protect what God, God's trying to do in us. We have to protect it. So when I don't have peace and I'm chaotic, what, what, what do I typically do? Freak out, yell at people, carry on, just like everybody else. So we, we panic. That's where you hit the panic button. What if, what if this is going to happen? What if that's going to happen? What if the diagnosis goes a different way? What if the surgery doesn't work? What if, what if, what if we're panicking? We worry. How am I going to provide? I'm going to handle this difficult situation. I'm going to take care of my family. We have fear. We can never do it. Never do it. This is like... Think about this in terms of like bungee jumping. I would never do it. And yet, all of these thoughts enter our minds. The mind is the battleground. The mind is the powerful tool given by God. But it can paralyze us. Or we can be set free by it. Because what? What do we know? That this is where the peace of God comes in. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind. It'll protect you. We read it. We think it. So do it. Allow the peace of God to protect you, to keep you safe, to keep you secure. 
See, when I am anxious about something, I take it to God in prayer with a thankful heart. I let my request be made known to God. I recognize all I have to be thankful for. I experience the peace of God, which surpasses all other forms of peace. And I am seeking that peace, which ultimately protects my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So it's only because of what Jesus does. It's not for me. It's not that I did something. It's that through Jesus Christ. So Jesus goes to the Father on your behalf. He's your great intercessor. Jesus doesn't want you to sit in anxiety. He wants you to be free because of your belief in him. Jesus wants to set you free based on his word and his promises. I have peace with God, but I also have peace in my life because of what Jesus has done. I have peace in all circumstance when I focus my attention on the peace giver. Or can I say it plainly to us? Jesus is the source of peace. Turn with me, if you will, to our final passage this morning, John 14. I want you to see that not only we have the peace of God, not only do we have peace with God, but we have peace from Jesus. John chapter 14. There's a whole discourse about how Jesus is going away and how he's going to leave his disciples, but how he's going to give them the Holy Spirit. And so the helper, the advocate, the Holy Spirit will be with you forever is what Jesus says. But in verse 25 through 31, Jesus gives his disciples some encouragement. 25 says this, these things I have spoken to you that while I am still with you, I'm telling you in advance, this is what's going to happen. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all things that I have said to you. Watch this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you had rejoiced because I am going to my father for my father is greater than I. And now I have told you before this, it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much to, with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has no claim on me. But I do what the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. Rise, let us go from here. The Holy Spirit's promised. This is what Jesus is telling them. He's saying, I am going to go away. I am going to die. I'm going to eventually go up into heaven and, ri and rise again. But he, but he says, peace I leave with you. Well, that seems odd, doesn't it? Because this is going to be a chaotic situation that's going to take place for these disciples. The one they've been following for the last three and a half years... He's going to die. Well, what does that mean, God? Or, or Jesus, what does that mean? What? I don't understand. I'm panicking, I'm panicking, I'm panicking. I, I, I have peace that I am giving to you. See, peace comes when we recognize the hope. Peace comes when we recognize the hope, the promises that Jesus gives. See, peace originates from Jesus. It's his peace. It's not something that we can manufacture by ritual. It's not something manufactured by doing the right thing. It's from Jesus. It's his peace. This is, <laughs> this is wild because this is the peace that eventually sent him to the cross. This is the peace that eventually sent him to the cross. Not that he didn't agonize over it. We know the story. His, his sweat was like drops of blood. He's agonizing over that moment. God, not my will, but your will. But it's the peace that he has in this thing to go to that cross. It's the peace that he had that he trusted that God had everything orchestrated and ordained. And so he even says here, I do as the Father commanded me. See, what we would like to think is that peace doesn't matter in our lives. And again, we, we medicate more. We try really hard more. We, we do all sorts of other things, but taking and getting the peace that Jesus gives us. I, and I would say it this way. 
The peace of Jesus is long-lasting. It's confident. It's overcoming peace. So no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance I find myself in, do not be afraid, Jesus says, of the things that are coming. Do not be afraid, I'm going back to the Father. Do not be afraid, someone's going to be with you. That is the Holy Spirit. Do not be afraid. Don't have to be anxious. I am going to die. That's part of the plan of God. Don't be worried or afraid. I'm giving you peace. See, the hope giver is also the peace giver. The hope giver is also giving peace that will exceed all forms of peace. See, I don't have to worry about my past. Think about that. I don't have to worry about my past because my sins were forgiven through Jesus' sacrifice. Therefore, I have peace with God. I don't have to worry about my present when I take it to God through Jesus. I experience the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. And I'm not saying that we don't have to go through hard stuff still. It's what we can have peace in the moment. We can have peace through those moments. What I'm saying is that we take it to the peace giver. We take that experience and we give it over to God. And so we don't have to even worry about our future. Why don't we have to worry about our future? I have peace with God still. I'm not going to get before him and he's going to say, nope, hell. No, nope, Jesus paid the price. It, means I'm not, it doesn't mean I'm not going to go through suffering in this life, but it means I'm, I'm not under the judgment or the wrath of God. I have peace with God so I can be confident about it. I have peace from God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what I know, church, is that many of us doubt. Come on. Many of us doubt God. Many of us shrink back in our faith about God. God doesn't listen. God doesn't answer. See, you're, you're shrinking back in your faith when times get hard. Shrinking back in your faith because something became difficult. Why aren't you trusting the peace giver to carry you through? See, the disciples experienced this in another way. Mark chapter 4. 35 to 40, it's, it's, they're going across the boat and, and Jesus tells the storm, peace, be still. Okay, we, we're familiar with this story. Can I get some head nods? Yeah, okay. After he does this, he says this, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? 